Portrait of Ruin, or more like, Best Castlevania Game Ever. Hey, you Review! Welcome back to another Castlevania Diary. If you're not familiar with this, in 2019 I said, hey, I've never played a Castlevania game before. I'm gonna play through all of them in sequential order of release. And here we are, almost a year and a half later, 22 entries later, and I've just completed Portrait of Ruin, one of the Castlevania games that was available on the DS. The second one, actually, that was available on DS. And last time when we talked about Dawn of Sorrow, which was the first game on DS, it had trumped the best game on Game Boy Advance, which was Aria of Sorrow. And all of these Metroidvania Castlevania games have just been getting better and better and better, except for Harmony of Dissonance, which kind of ruined things there. Took a little bit of a step back. But then it went Aria of Sorrow, Dawn of Sorrow, this one, Portrait of Ruin. And I really look forward to seeing what the next one on the DS is going to be, uh, which is something, oh man, I forgot, Order of Ecclesia. But apparently that one is hard as balls and I'm probably going to cry a lot playing that. So anyways, let's talk about Portrait of Ruin and why I think this is the best Castlevania game that I've played so far. First of all, it's a Metroidvania, which is one of my fondest genres and yet we still don't really know how to define a Metroidvania. I dare you to define Metroidvania in the comments below that does not meet any other criteria that works in a 3D, 2D set. Anyways, no more guidance. Let me know how you would describe a Metroidvania. So the interesting aspect in Portrait of Ruin is, of course, uh, once again, we don't have any Belmonts to play with, which is kind of sad. Um, but you get this like two character system where you play as basically a melee character, a.k.a. Jonathan, and you play as a magic user, a.k.a. Charlotte. And it's not the first time we see a Castlevania game kind of have these different characters uh, with different powers. For some reason, they always associate male gender to punching things in the face and female genders to manipulating the elements to uh, unleash unfathomable pain and suffering onto enemies. Go figure why. So I have to say I don't like Jonathan. Jonathan is kind of like the little whiny Luke Skywalker of the Castlevania series. He, he's just like, I got, you know, he's got the vampire killer, he's got the whip, but he's not strong enough to use it. He's just com kind of complaining about everything, about how he's not good enough, not as good as his dad, not as good as the Belmonts. He's just, he's just whiny. And I'm whining about the whiny guy. So that makes me about as good as Jonathan. And then Charlotte's kind of there, and I really wish she wasn't just a mage user because her character, I felt, was a lot stronger, was a lot more interesting. And it's just because I don't really like using magic users, that I didn't use her that much. Um, so I had to I had to stick it with Jonathan because I like using the whip. Uh, no axe, no, I didn't use the axe as much in this one. So I do like the fact that they did not go crazy with the puzzle element of a two-player system. So it was very easy for them to just like to to incorporate tons of puzzles using two characters that you have to swap around. Like oh, push the button with this character while this character runs and does something. They could have done that. They didn't. They only did it in pretty much one section that I remember that you have to like alternate between carts and jump and duck and coordinate. And that's the only time they did it. I was like, that's good enough. You showed me the mechanic. I got a sense of it. I'm really glad I don't have to do more of this. It was it was just enough. Um, you know, Castlevania games, they're not supposed to be puzzle games. You know, a little bit of puzzle in it, but if you go too much, that's like putting too much milk in your coffee. It's, it doesn't, it's no longer a coffee. It's like, what are you doing? That's a dessert. So, um, I, I do think that that was inspired, the whole dual system was inspired a little bit by uh, Dawn of Sorrow's dual wielding mechanic, how you could have two configurations, but now they, they configure those two characters, which added to the story, which also added to the mechanic. Uh, I just remember that there's a boss where you actually have to switch between melee and, and magic use on them. I didn't know that at first. That's another cool way to use the duality system. So the way that they in introduced it or um, executed it in this game, fantastic. They did a great job there. Everything else, um, we're seeing this, I'm seeing this actually in throughout a lot of Castlevania. Castlevania is to Pokemon in the sense that they love to reuse assets and I'm okay with that. It's kind of always fun to see old friendly, well, they're not friendly, old enemies resurface. So enemies um, that you would have seen, I feel like pretty much everything from Symphony of the Night onwards, however they looked in either Symphony of the Night or any game that came after that, you start seeing those models coming back with a little bit more definition maybe. And it's cool to see those guys because it makes you feel like you're part of a familiar universe. Speaking of a, fam of a familiar universe, we're in a castle again, uh, but this time they incorporated this mechanic where you can go into 
portraits, hence Portrait of Ruins, which takes you to all sorts of parts of the world, like, uh, I guess you go to, like, Egyptian temples, and you go to, uh, like, a market. It's a very cool mechanic that helps expand the scope of what you can do in a traditional Castlevania game of just being in Dracula's castle, that now you can pretty much envision anything. And they did a pretty good job with it. I would have loved to have seen them take it even further. Um, they did go in a weird direction in one world where you go and you see, like, a clown world, not like that, did not like the music there, did not like the enemies there, and did not like the fact that everything was just mirrored. No. Um, so that was fun. The castle felt small, I have to say. Maybe it's because, you know, the castle wasn't doubled, tripled, mirrored and all that. But this iteration of the castle felt very small. And maybe that's because they focus more on the portraits. Um, but it was a little disappointing. At, maybe it's because I actually had, like, so much fun with this game. The castle felt small. I like the fact that every region has its own percentage on the map. That is very satisfying to me as a completionist. Uh, they went a little overboard by giving you a thousand percent completion. I don't know why they did that instead of just kind of taking that thousand, shrinking it into the hundred percent and giving it. I feel like once you go over a hundred percent and you take it to a crazy limit like one thousand, percentages don't even matter at that point. You're just disrespecting the art. So yeah, try to stick it to a hundred. Like sometimes, like Mario games where you can like sometimes go to like 103 percent or 108 percent, that's classy. But when you go a thousand percent, that's just gluttonous. Uh, other things, so we've got the gimmicky endings, which are back. Of course, it wouldn't be a Castlevania game if you didn't have three endings, which you're just like, that can't be the right ending. And then the one good ending, which you have to learn by talking to your friend at recess, uh, and then they tell you that you have to equip the, the crazy like bracelet and do the thing. In this one, to be fair, it's not as bad. However, they do give you enough tips to figure it out on your own if you're smart. I was not. But basically to get the good ending, you actually have to listen to the side characters and you actually have to listen to their advice when they say, maybe you shouldn't do this thing when you encounter the final boss. And that, you know, challenges you to hold back your instinct of doing what you want to do and being like, you know what, maybe, maybe I'll go the Jedi route and throw my lightsaber away, if you know what I mean. Um, so that kind of, you know, the gimmicky endings they're kind of a trope at this point I used to be more frustrated with them but now I'm just like I expect it so when it happens I'm just like okay here we go okay that's the bad ending let's look up how to get the good ending let's do that oh and then there's like the premium ending it's like an EA model um the side quest element of the game I love so there's a quest giver and they're like if you do and, and these quests what I like specifically not only do they help you get access to better items and upgrades uh, and just a stronger character overall but you get access to little hidden um, nods of the game. So Castlevania always has the most random Easter eggs in all of them. In fact, I should probably just make an Easter egg video of all the Castlevania games. That'd be pretty cool. And I find the side quest giver helps you um, find all of these little Easter eggs. So it's nice that now the, the mechanics to find these things is kind of integrated in the game. And I love the fact that it's basically a checklist. I love quests. so. Really like that system here. Some of them were a little crazy. Uh, like mastering the spear. So that's another system. Another unique system here is all of your weapons have like uh, a special ability to them and you have to master them, which often means killing a thousand characters with it, which is pretty grindy. If you want 100% this game in the proper sense of like mastering all your weapons, there goes your next two, two years of life. Perfect thing to do when you're in quarantine. I did not like that. I'm happy that some of them are smaller. So I had a cream pie weapon. I have to say, I love the cream pie. I love cream pieing. Take that back. But the cream pie had a hundred. You only had to kill a hundred enemies with a cream pie to unlock its like superpower. And it's crazy because at one point that that is. So at one point you have to fight the illusion of Richter Belmont, and he's weak to cream pies because I guess he's diabetic or something. So I destroyed Richter. I died to Richter many times, only to learn. Oh, I can just throw pies in this man's face and unlock the like this is the craziest lore when you think of Castlevania. Like if you if you took what my actions and put it into a Netflix series or an anime, it's like, oh he's so strong with the, the vampire killer, I can't unlock its power, and then it's like just throw pies in his face. Sorry, I'm off track. Uh other than that, speaking of Richter, uh endgame content, so there's always post endgame content in all the, the more recent Castlevania games, whether that's a harder mode or stuff. Uh, I find the Metroidvania ones, they tend to add more fun characters to play as. And this one you get to either play as Richter, which is a freaking 
good time. Richter feels amazing on the DS and just to go through the castle with all of his abilities and to just destroy things and level up, fantastic. It's, it's, it's as good as the Julius Belmont feel, except now you're playing with nostalgia. Uh, and then there's the sisters. There's these two sisters, which is entirely played by touching the touch screen. You can alternate between them, but it's all touch based controls. And, you know, this is in the era of the DS where they're trying to figure out, game developers are trying to figure out, what do I do with the second screen? And you could tell this was something they tested in development. And they're like, I don't think it's a good idea to implement it in the game. Let's put it as extra content. Thank God they did that because it's so boring. You touch an enemy and they're just like, blah, 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 and they just destroy that enemy. So you just touch what you want destroyed and then you move around. It's not an enjoyable experience. It's a cool gimmick. It's fun to try. Let's just be very thankful they went with traditional controls for the rest of the game. And that's pretty much all of the key things I want to talk about. Everything else is on par with the re uh, recent Metroidvania stuff. Oh, the difficulty level. That's the last thing I want to talk about. The difficulty level on this game is pure bliss. You're actually never really grinding because you need to level up. You're never really struggling because you're under leveled. The way the game is laid out lets you level up very, very comfortably and then you get to the end and I got destroyed at the end but that's because I didn't have the right items once you got the right items I was okay and my level was never like crazy under level so it worked out pretty good but maybe also that's because I was doing the side quests and not rushing like a crazy dude through these games like I usually do so this is all why all these points are why Portrait of Bruin what has been my favorite Castlevania experience Metroidvania so far we're, we're almost done with, with this whole Castlevania journey, there's one more 3D game, one more Metroidvania, and then we're gonna go into the spin-off stuff, anything that has Castlevania in the name. So it's a little it's a little bittersweet to be here, but I look forward to seeing what the next few games have to bring. I'll see you guys next time on the next Castlevania Diaries, and until then, keep it classy. <laughs>